What are the private phone carrier options other than Mint Mobile? How can you use digital payments in real life more privately? Should you use BitLocker or Veracrypt on Windows? How can you shred old data effectively? Can you remove a car's modem? And how was Henry's time in Vienna? Welcome to the Q&A for Surveillance Support 209, where we answer questions from our amazing patrons who allow us to make this podcast for all of you. You can view and join the questions on patreon.com slash surveillance pod or at xmrchat.com slash surveillance pod. With that, we'll start on Patreon. We only had, well, we had one person submitting questions this week, but there's a couple of questions, but this is our regular David Johnson. And we're gonna start off with the question of, have you or people you know used other US MVNOs similar to Mint Mobile in terms of privacy, such as Tello, Red Pocket, US Mobile, and what has the experience been like? Not that there's anything wrong with Mint, but it's always good to have options ready in case a particular company shuts down, gets acquired, et cetera. For those who don't know, MVNO means mobile virtual network operator. So like they said, Mint Mobile, Boost, Red Pocket, US Mobile. A lot of the time, these companies are piggybacking off of an existing telecom like Mint Mobile. I think most of them use T-Mobile, but there's also Verizon. There's also, I think AT&T is technically their own company, things like that. I have used Boost Mobile just because for a long time, my mother had us on a family plan because then it was cheaper per person. And she, God, I love my mom, but she really needed to learn the difference between cheap and frugal. And I think a lot of the time, especially with technology, she was very cheap. So she would always go for Boost Mobile, who is absolute garbage and a terrible company, both in terms of their cell service and their customer service. Highly recommend against them. Totally not worth it. But technically they're dirt cheap. I was able to get a whole year's worth of mobile service for like a hundred bucks. But uh, yeah, I hated them as a company. As soon as I was able to, I moved over to Mint Mobile. I haven't had any issues with Mint. As far as I can tell, they're the cheapest. I was actually looking into Visible because they're kind of like Verizon's competitor to Mint, but they're significantly more expensive. Like Mint Mobile is 15 bucks a month. And for the record, that is the yearly rate. So in order to get that, you have to pay like 200 bucks a year, but it evens or it averages out to 15 bucks a month. Visible is like 25 a month. But to be fair, I think they also have like unlimited data and stuff like that. To finish answering the question, before we move to Mint, my wife was also prepaying directly with Verizon, which was still cheaper than using a Verizon plan. I think some of them, even like the longer you're with them, the lower the price gets. So it'll initially be like 25 bucks a month. And then the second month, it'll be 20. And then the third month, it'll be 15. And then it'll stay at 15 from there. The thing that makes these prepaid plans, whether they're an MVNO or whether they're directly with the company, the thing that makes them great for privacy is they typically don't care what data you give them. They just want the money. So you can go in there and give them a fake name. I do not recommend John Smith. That'll probably set off some fraud alerts. Just give them a fake name, give them a, an address of a hotel downtown, and they don't care. As long as the check clears, you're good to go. And you can use a privacy card. The same privacy concerns as far as the actual usage of the device apply as they would with any other carrier. I am aware of some of the other ones. If anything ever happens with Mint, I am ready to try and jump ship to some of the other ones. I would prefer Verizon because I've heard they have better network security than other providers, but... I mean, at the end of the day, a phone's a phone, a carrier's a carrier. Getting reception at an affordable price is really my priority and not having to turn over my social security number in exchange for it, which is really what these MVNOs allow. There's also other, like, what is it? Pretty good phone privacy. We covered them a couple years ago when they launched. They're pretty expensive. And I've seen some people dispute how effective is it to change? What is it they change? Your IMEI? There's two main identifiers that cell towers use. It's either the IMEI or the IMSI. I can't remember which one. Pretty good phone privacy changes one of those. I've seen some people say like, this isn't really effective. It's kind of like privacy theater. Those are some additional tools you could keep in your pocket. I think there might be another one I'm forgetting, but those are some additional tools that you could like kind of keep in the back of your mind to see if maybe they fit your threat model and if you can justify the expense. Yeah, I used to use Mint. It was fine. Again, there's nothing really special about any of these services outside the fact they're prepaid. You can go through AT&T prepaid. You can go through Verizon prepaid. I did move to Visible mainly because I had the Calyx hotspot at the time, which is a great device. And I wanted to just reduce the devices I had. I don't like charging devices. It's annoying. I don't think people think about how much they have to think about charging devices constantly. So my goal is to have as few devices per day as possible. It's part of the reason why I'm wearing these earbuds. I dropped the Bluetooth and pods or whatever. Where I'm going with this is Visible has the unlimited hotspot plan. So that way I can still like use my laptop on the go. That's really the main separation, I think, between Visible and Mint. You're paying for that unlimited hotspot. But it is more expensive. But it, it, it's kind of just a use case thing. Anything prepaid is going to be pretty good. So just knock yourself out. Next question is from David Johnson. Still, he left quite a few questions here. Do you know of any U.S. privacy-oriented cards that work with Apple Pay for privacy in in-person payments? And then they said that privacy.com does not, for example. 
It does. It's just in a beta. So I actually had the ability, I, I think I still do, to add privacy.com cards to my Apple Pay. And it shows up when you add a new card on mobile and it says add it to your wallet. And it works for both Google and Apple Pay, I believe. So I don't know when that's rolling out to the public, but it is a thing. Outside that, I, I don't have any other suggestions. I don't know of any like prepaid cards that work with Apple Pay, for example. So it's probably just any debit or credit card you could otherwise get and whatever privacy policies attached to that. My main thought is like, why not just use cash? We are moving into a society where there's a lot of places that don't take cash. So I think it is a good idea to have something like Apple Pay, or I think Google Pay is also starting to catch up to some of the privacy features that Apple Pay has. When you're in person, if, if privacy is your concern, I think cash is definitely going to be the way to go. When cash is not an option, I think, yeah, a privacy.com card, if you can get into that beta and your mileage may vary because, you know, we have thousands of listeners and if they suddenly get thousands of emails, they're probably going to be like, no, but if one or two people email them and be like, hey, my friend told me about this beta, I use Apple Pay all the time, I'd really love to get in on this, they might be willing to let you in. Again, I'm not making any promises, I don't want you to flood their support email. So if you're one of those people who's like, yeah, I don't use it that much, I can wait, I would say wait, but if you're someone who's like, no, I use this all the time, you could try reaching out. But otherwise, if you have to use Apple Pay as it is, I mean, it's definitely not ideal, I would prefer something like that extra layer of privacy.com. But Apple Pay, uh, again, we're going to refer you to Jonah's video on YouTube. He does a whole breakdown, and I think it's a little bit out of date because I think shortly after he released it, Google released some new privacy features. But he does a whole comparison of like, here's how Apple Pay works. Here's how Google Pay works. Here's the pros and cons of both. Here's when you should use something like that and you shouldn't, et cetera. It's, it's a really good video, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. And then you said you have a couple of follow-up questions about BitLocker based on one of the stories we covered last week, as well as a follow-up question about people erasing data from their old devices. So first, the BitLocker question. You said, what do you think is better for encrypting a Windows OS, BitLocker or Veracrypt? While Veracrypt is likely cryptographically stronger, BitLocker is native to Windows, so it seems less likely that a future update will break your system when it's encrypted with BitLocker, since Microsoft is more likely to test that prior to update release. Overall, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. I did point out in the patron version of that episode, there have been stories about BitLocker breaking and people not being able to log in and decrypt their stuff. Veracrypt, when you make it, specifically tells you like, here is a recovery disk, save this somewhere safe. And then if you ever have any issues, I've never had to use it, thankfully, but from what I understand, it's a way to kind of like externally decrypt it in case something goes wrong. But other than that, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like BitLocker is native on Windows 11. It, it's free if you sign up for a Microsoft account, which I don't really think is worth it in my opinion. You could pay for a pro version and get access to BitLocker. It's probably going to be a smoother and more reliable experience, but also Veracrypt is free. I like Veracrypt. I've never had any issues with it. Henry has had issues with it. So I would say... Whatever you go with, be sure to keep backups and maybe consider testing one out and see which one you like. The last question is really quick. For non-operating system drives, like flash drives and SSDs and stuff, is there a good way to like deal with that before selling them? Yeah, SSDs are always kind of tough. And I think that's why the general advice is to encrypt before using them. And I think that's probably always going to be the easier way to go. So if you can actually, I know we just talked about it, if you could set up Veracrypt on these drives before, like the first thing you do when you get it, set up Veracrypt then you don't have to worry as much when you want to sell the drive because then you just delete the Veracrypt container, it's an encrypted container, and then you just sell the drive and it's not a big deal. So that is best case scenario and that's what I would recommend doing. Otherwise, yeah, you kind of have to use one of these tools that claims to erase it more securely and you have to hope it does it well and yeah, it might cause some extra damage to the drive. But from what I've heard, it's not as big of an issue as it's made out to be. Those are kind of your main options right now. That was kind of my thought is um, when it comes to solid states and stuff, regardless of like if they're operating system or not, I don't really think the read write lifespan is that big of a deal for the average person. If you're like wiping it every week, or if you're like one of those people who likes to go really hardcore and reinstall your operating system every six months or something at that point, I think, yeah, you're definitely going to wear it out faster than normal. But if you're just using a normal flash drive or a backup drive or something, I really don't think it's a, a big deal for most people. So me personally, I don't buy used hard drives. I like to buy them brand new and just run them into the ground. So I don't really give away a lot of, or like sell a lot of old devices. But if I did, I would say maybe just, yeah, run a full format like a couple of times or find a software that'll, so like using Veracrypt as an example, you can do like different passes of encryption, right? Like you can do one pass, three pass, five pass, seven pass, and 35 pass. I think three to five is going to be the sweet spot for most people. And I feel the same way about a format. If you format something three or four times, the odds that even if they are like a world-class physicist, 
they're going to have a really damn hard time pulling that, you know, assuming it's a good format. Unless you're like Edward Snowden or you've been storing proof of aliens on that hard drive. First of all, send it to me because I'm a sci-fi nerd and I really want to know. But barring that, I think you're going to be good. Our next question comes from XMR Chat, and it comes from Null. For those who don't know, XMR Chat is uh, it's a website we've started using where you don't have to sign up in a recurring fashion like Patreon, and you also don't have to give any personal information. You can tip us a little bit of Monero, and you can leave a comment. And you know, some people just say, "Hey, big fan, thanks for the podcast, and we appreciate you very much." But something we're also offering is you can use this as a way to leave a question. This user chooses to go by the name Noel, and they say, I've never heard anyone suggest removing the cell modem from a new car, and I wonder why that is. I understand this can be a pretty involved process depending on the car, but it should guard against dealerships opting you into things without your knowledge. So first of all, I still haven't read the latest edition of Extreme Privacy, and I know that sucks. I need to do that. I'm trying to read more this year, so I'm hoping to get to it soon. Last I checked, Michael Basil definitely recommends that. I would only recommend either A, telling the dealership, I want this removed. Some of them might not want to do that because it might, and, or they might warn you like that'll break the warranty. So keep that in mind is they might say like, Hey, we can do that, but that's going to void your warranty. And we're not going to cover it. Or they'll just straight up say, no, I won't do that. In which case you have to go to a mechanic. Point being, I would only do that if either the dealership is willing to do it, or you have a trustworthy mechanic who is like, I'll take it out for you. They'll probably say the same thing. This might void some things. It may actually not be possible. It may interfere with some of the other important features and safety features of the car, I think it doesn't hurt to ask whether that's the dealership or the mechanic to go around. And especially if multiple, if you go to multiple dealerships and they're like, I'm not going to do this because it will screw with the brakes or something, then you can't do it. But if you, you know, if you find the dealerships, like we're not going to do that, but you can take it to a mechanic and the mechanic's like, yeah, I'll do it. But FYI, no, no warranty. Just make sure you do a lot of research and you're aware of the potential risks of it, whether that's simply not to sound like a broken record, but whether that's as simple as no warranty or whether that's as serious as like serious functionality loss. I'm not a car guy, so I don't know. Yeah, when I was digging and trying to research more into Tesla stuff, this was an option, but it's always the more nuclear option. And for certain cars, it's kind of, it depends on the vehicle. Some of them are pretty complicated to pull off because like, at least in the case with the Tesla, you actually have to like get into the central computer of it and there's a little slot for the SIM card. And I think that was the recommended way to do it is essentially like removing the SIM card of the car. But every car is going to be different, so it might be easier, harder, et cetera. And yeah, you could take it to someone to do it for you, but it's pretty nuclear. And a lot of these new cars are so connected where a lot of the diagnostics, when you take it to repair, it requires uh, like connecting to the car nowadays. So it, it's more than just you might lose your Sirius XM or whatever. It actually can sometimes go more into like how you maintain your car. So just be aware of that. It is a very nuclear option and I would recommend looking at alternatives before that. But it is an option for people who just want to be done with it and don't care about the consequences. So the last question is from Mercurius Lurker, longtime listener and fan. Thanks for the podcast. I was there for the first SR podcast. I don't know if that was the first one that I did where I was like practically on crack. <laughs> Because, yeah, you should watch that one. I, I don't know what, what was happening to me then. I guess I was just so excited to start this podcast. Or if it was the one here with Nate. But uh, you mentioned back in December that he was in Vienna. Oh, yeah, because I had the background. When were you exactly there? And for how long? What did you see in like? So I was in just Europe in general, just traveling and working. And there were some people I wanted to meet up with in the privacy community and also some work. And it was... Good. Yeah. Like I was pretty much just hopping around to major cities. I didn't go with a plan. So I didn't leave going, oh, I'm going to go to Vienna. I just kind of pretty much like I came and I just picked out cities to go to. And then I had to hit up some work along the way. And Vienna was just part of that journey. And I was only there for like three days, three or four days. But I really enjoyed it. It was actually probably the most memorable place I visited on the trip. I loved the architecture. It was this really weird blend of like historical but modern and I just really enjoyed the architecture. I thought the Citadel was gorgeous. The catacombs were really cool to check out and the food really blew me away. Not that I had low expectations, I just haven't really heard much about food there. And the food was just incredible. I had some of the best food that I've ever had in Vienna. So I was really impressed. And your guys' croissants really pop off. I didn't know this because I went to Paris first. Croissants were actually invented in Austria. <laughs> so not in France. And I do feel like the quality was reflected in that. And the vegan food in Vienna was just incredible. And I was able to find everything I needed. So it was awesome. Those were the questions this week about private phone carrier options, not including Mint Mobile. 
using digital payments privately in real life, BitLocker versus Veracrypt, shredding old data effectively, removing a car's modem, and Vienna slash European experiences. So thank you guys for tuning in and asking questions. Good questions this week. There's always good questions. You guys always leave really good questions. We appreciate the questions and we appreciate your support to the podcast. Again, if you're not already a member, you can join our Q&As by joining Patreon, patreon.com slash surveillance pod. You also get access to a signal group where you can chat with other fans of the show, other privacy enthusiasts. If you sign up at $10 a month, you also get access to the ad-free episodes and stuff. And of course, if you're looking to protect your privacy a little more and you don't really care about the group chat, or you just want to ask like one question, then we also have xmrchat.com slash surveillance pod where you can pay in Monero. So thank you guys again and stay tuned for episode 210 coming this weekend.